online events. My name is Dr. Julianne Curran. I am the Vice President of Market Innovation for Pulse Canada, and I am also the Board Chair for the Agri-Food Innovation Council. I'd like to start off by thanking you all for participating today. Before we begin, I just have a few instructions to provide you with. Everyone other than our speakers will be placed on mute to enable the conference to go forward without any interruption. You will all be able to ask questions through the Q&A window. Our staff will monitor this to establish trends or common questions, which will be asked of the participants after the presentations. There will also be an opportunity for participants to directly ask questions to the panelists. We will explain the format for this once we get to that part of the meeting. We know that this online format does not replace an in-person meeting, but it also does enable more participation from people in various regions. So we look forward to having some good discussions with you all today. I'd also like to give you a brief overview of the Agri-Food Innovation Council or AIC. Founded in 1920, AIC acts as a voice for agri-food research and innovation in Canada. We consider agri-food as encompassing the whole food system from production to consumption. AIC is experienced in holding meetings to develop strategies for dealing with various issues. For example, in 2016, AIC developed a national policy on agri-food research and innovation. In 2017, AIC developed standards to enable the dissemination of research. A conference organized by AIC in 2018 was focused on defining priorities for the future of agri-food research in education. And in 2019, the focus was on artificial intelligence and robotics. In addition to these initiatives, AIC has produced reports for the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, the National Research Council, and other groups. The Agri-Food Innovation Council is a membership-based organization, and we do encourage all of you to join. This conference today is intended as a forum to start a discussion on agri-food research and innovation, common priorities post-COVID-19. Some questions that are being raised now include, has COVID-19 changed some elements of the whole food system? Were there food security issues, packing and processing plants, retail, availability of some products? Should we accelerate work on artificial intelligence and robotics to avoid crowding in some plants? Lots of work was done to define research priorities, including a great deal of consultations by Agri-Food Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, but are they still adequate in a post-COVID-19 world? Are there new research priorities? These are just some of the ideas our speakers today will deal with. I would like to thank our sponsors for this event, the National Research Council and AgWest Bio. AgWest Bio is represented by its new president and CEO, Dr. Karen Churchill, who is also one of AIC's board members. And the NRC is represented by Denise LeBlanc McDonald, who I'd now like to invite to say a few words. Thank you, Julianne, I appreciate it. I'm very pleased to, that NRC is partnering with AIC for this event. And I thought I'd just start by letting you know why we're, we're interested, uh, a little bit about our agri-food strategy. Um, I am a Director General at the National Research Council. I'm the Director General of the um, uh, Aquatic and Crop Resource Development Research Centre, and I have teams across Canada. And we are the lead in NRC's agri-food strategy. And then I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19. You probably heard about us in the news and a little bit about why we feel it's important to participate in this and actually to partner in this with AIC. So our agri-food strategy really has three pillars and it really is to address what we see as government priorities. And I'm pleased to see over the last number of years that agri-food is a priority for the government. And we want to work with you, with partners, to address the innovation needs and the evolving innovation needs of the agri-food sector. So our three pillars are really about advancing scientific knowledge where possible, creating new technologies, and to really promote 
you know, economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable food systems. And that's our part of our mandate in this research center. And certainly we run that for NRC. And those three pillars are, are threefold. The first one is the alternative plant-based protein sources and co-products and processing innovations. And those first two, these first two systems are really um, under what we call our sustainable protein production program, which is in support of the Protein Industries Canada Supercluster. And our third pillar is about uh, changing in specialized environments. And we do that with partners. And I wanna be clear across all those systems, across anything we do, NRC values partnerships. Many of you are on this call and on this webinar, and really it's about partnerships. And just a little bit what we're doing, you know, in support of the Protein Industry Canada Supercluster, our objectives really are to collaborate with protein supercluster funded projects, with partners, and we really want to help build a protein, plant protein ecosystem in Canada. And three themes, just for your information, uh, improved protein sources, sustainable production practices, and then there's manufacturing and processing innovations. And that is a strong, it's a pillar within my research center. It's important to NRC and certainly we work closely with PIC and other part players. Uh, more information is certainly anytime, you know, I'm open to doing that. A little bit about our, our third system, which certainly would support the protein um, industry Canada supercluster, but also I, I believe help the, uh, the ag food sector in general is really about changing in specialized environments. And what does that mean? It really is twofold. It's looking at crop adaptation to changing Canadian environments. What is the impact of disease and sustainability? And then Northern food security. Can we do controlled environment agriculture and design and technology integration to really uh, use those crop adaptation technology and deploy to a con controlled environments? It really is our Northern food security um, program that we're developing and projects we have. So that's really to give you, we have a broad base of experience. It's not just in my research center, but it is a strong thrust of what NRC does in ag food with partners. And, and I think the topic of today is looking at how we can move forward post COVID-19, what many are calling the new normal. So what has NRC been doing? I know we're in the news, but I wanted to give you a highlight. A lot of this is on our website, but a little bit of, um, uh, why it's important that we have this conversation now as, as partners and in the innovation in the ag food sector. Um, so we working, you know, for the COVID-19, we working with clients and partners from day one to really start looking at what projects and initiatives will, you know, support Canada today, sort of in the crisis phase, but going forward. And the first thing that NRC has as a role is protect our people. So many of you know that we've been teleworking we have protocols for health and safety, we're maintaining facilities, but it's also important that um, we look and at our technologies maybe that our labs can develop to support the future. And we're helping to protect Canadians. And there's a couple of things that you've heard about, I'm sure. And one is the pandemic challenge program. And that really is bringing together industry, other government departments and academia, our post-secondary institutions to truly get together and find solutions. So. The pillars, and again, I can give more details anytime, you know, you know where I am. It's on our website, rapid detection and diagnosis. Uh, therapeutics vaccine development, you're hearing a lot about that. Um, we're also looking at digital health technologies, you know, for the rural areas. And then really what we've been doing quickly and that part of the program I'm involved with as well is adaptive responses. How do we do things quickly in partnership with Public Health Agency of Canada, for example, and Health Canada? And the, the other pillar of that, of course, is the biomanufacturing capacity. So increasing what we can do in Canada for vaccine production. We have a pilot plant in um, already uh, look, looking at human health and therapeutics in Montreal. And there have been um, a $15 million investment by the government in that. And another $29 million will actually um, phase, uh, be phased into us to help expand the ability to produce these vaccines in Canada. And of course, that's important. So we'll have a GMP compliant regulatory standard pilot plant in the public system. And I think what's also important to note that IRAP, our Industrial Research Assistance Program, has been working with Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada, I said, to really have these challenges to get some new technologies to market. And that innovation challenge has resulted in, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars being invested in companies to get technologies to market now that we can use in Canada. And there's several of those, and some of those are on the website, so I'll direct you there again. 
So we have this innovation, uh, Innovative Solutions Canada and IRAP work together and many companies were assisted there. Another uh, activity from IRAP you may not know about is we had sort of pitch session, sessions, again, to meet companies one-on-one uh, -on -one virtually uh, to talk about what technologies could investment by IRAP and are seeing the federal government actually put them on a very fast track. And uh, the last one, of course, is IRAP will continue to support companies in all sectors, including the ag food sector as we go forward. And all that to say, NRC, you know, we see that as sort of the crisis activities that NRC can do. But what I'm looking for today and why we're partnering is how can NRC refocus our activities potentially in our ag food strategy, in our ag food program to actually meet the needs that you see, the needs that you define as important to the sector. And you know, where do we need as the research center that I'm the director general of, NRC can take our technologies and that we can do have new innovative projects to meet the ag food sector needs. How can I ensure, how can we ensure that NRC is there to develop new technologies with you, to have solutions and maybe to have some disruptive science. I think if anything this has learned is that Canada can come together for solutions. And I'd like to see the ag food sector, you know, now and you know as we go into the new normal come together to develop solutions that support the sector so that's what i have to say today i'm, I'm pleased to to partner um, going forward we will be working with the aic and others of you around the table to help us design our program our ag food uh, strategy for nrc because we are seeing changes as julianne mentioned you know there are some changes happening now so working uh, with partners um, uh, we would like to develop our strategy to support, best support the industry. So that's what I have to say. Very pleased to be here and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Denise, that's uh, much appreciated. Uh, my name is Serge Bui, I'm the CEO of the Agri-Food Innovation Council. Um, I've been uh, uh, in that position for uh, uh, a few years now. And um, I'm pleased to have uh, to 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 know that we're able to host this meeting and discuss uh, the uh, issues that we are going to be discussing today. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was uh, I was uh, making a presentation. Well, uh, three months ago, I was making a presentation at uh, no, now four months ago, I was making a presentation at the um, finance committee uh, in the House of Commons uh, to talk about uh, the priorities for agri-food research and innovation and. In, uh, and uh, the world has changed uh, since. Uh, it's been uh, quite, uh, quite amazing. And we felt, uh, we felt it was important to, to bring the community together to discuss um, what, or what those changes are and how we can uh, work with them to, to decide how we're gonna move, uh, uh, move, uh, move ahead in defining priorities or redefining priorities and deciding how we're going to be um, uh, changing uh, uh, some of the things that we're doing uh, in the future. <clears throat> COVID-19 has had a major impact uh, on the sector, um, and uh, we did uh, we did a bit of a survey uh, uh, prior to this event. And um, I want to thank all of you for responding. And uh, we had a number of other organizations that are not on this call that also provided responses. And 94% um, uh, of the organization surveyed um, indicated that they were impacted by COVID-19 and that their sector was impacted by COVID-19. 55% said this, uh, the impact was significant. And uh, what's also very telling is that 72% of the, of the respondents said that uh, because of COVID-19, they're gonna have to, weigh, to, to find new ways to do things. Um, and uh, I think this is where we, we have to focus on, on uh, on in the near on the near future because we do we do have to uh, get a better sense of where we're going to be uh, going um, uh, with uh, uh, the impact of uh, of uh, this pandemic. Um, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, I went to the store and I I went to buy flour, um, and I couldn't find flour in the store. Uh, my wife wanted to to she gets movies and she wants to have her frozen fruits. No frozen fruits in the. In, in the freezers at the store. Um, those are things that most Canadians are not used to. We, 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 we just get up, we get in our car and uh, we drive to the store, we pick up what we want and we don't expect it not to be there. And if we, if we don't find it, we get grumpy. Um, and, and 
and the reality of things um, as we've uh, we've seen in the last little while. Um, maybe it's uh, it's the way um, some things are happening in Northern Canada, uh, and I think for Southern Canada, however, um, uh, food security has not been an issue. We've had uh, restaurants uh, uh, close all over the, 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 the country, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a major disaster. I'm pleased to have uh, Restaurants Canada uh, on the panel to provide some, some element of their thoughts on, on this issue. But uh, as I'm here in my office in the market in Ottawa, um, I can see restaurants being boarded with uh, plywood um, uh, to avoid uh, uh, break-ins and, and uh, simply because they won't be opening anytime soon. The market is deserted. It's quite something to see. Um, and this is not going to change. There are, uh, the consumers are asking for new ways to, to purchase things. They're asking for uh, uh, new ways to, 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 to get their, package, uh, their food package, packaged in. Uh, if you go to stores, you will notice much more of uh, individually packaged uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. And, and, and that's a result of this uh, crisis today. Um, uh, and I think uh, we, we need to know whether or not this is going to be a long term uh, issue or a short term issue. Um, and, and that's going to impact a, a lot of our decision making uh, uh, processes uh, in the future. Processing plants, we've, we've, we've heard major issues uh, uh, in the media uh, leading to the slaughter of a number of uh, animals in Quebec. Um, uh, how do we deal with those things in the future? Um, so those are all issues that we, we need to, to look at. I'm really pleased to have um, uh, a number of you on the call today. There's uh, about 80 people that uh, uh, are on this video conference um, and all uh, uh, selected um, uh, leaders of uh, the sector because we need to find together uh, uh, some solutions. Um, it, it is important as well to, to, to note that uh, a lot of the respondents uh, to the survey indicated that they, they believe that we, we need new priorities for research and innovation um, in the future. And, and, um, and that, that's important. And uh, some of the things that they mentioned were uh, food security with a little focus on local production, automation to re replace human labor, revamp supply chain structures um, to identify potential vulnerabilities in the existing production system, increase digital connect connectedness and integration of big data, machine learning and AI technologies in, in the sector, economic research to reassess business models that rely on global supply chain and our trade, scalable value added processing techniques, elimination, reduction of waste, uh, of waste, Emergency preparedness workshops, courses for food processors and producers, low input, low emission production systems, focus on management practices with an emphasis on risk management and sector resilience, safe and cost effective production, processing and packaging of agri food, new ways to introduce research results, technologies, and products at the farm level while sustaining widespread compliance and social distancing guidelines, and productivity maximization, uh, example precision ag uh, agriculture. I think that those, those were good, very good ideas and I think this will definitely uh, indicate that um, uh, we, we need to look at different priorities. And it's quite interesting to, to see as well that uh, people have talked in the survey, people mentioned different systems um, such as a self-sufficient value chain with less or no reliance on global food safety, global food supply chains or systems. The Canadian market should take priority over international trade exports. Uh, better collaboration between academia and industry association. A cross-sectoral approach, approach to innovation. Risk management strategy to strengthen the sector and re research-related activities. Long-term cost-effective health and safety measures. Integrated innovation programming across provinces. Increased federal funding for research and development and restructuring of existing funding models based on matching funding systems to enable research and commercialization to occur, and high-skilled labor and expertise to increase technological capacity and sustain technological change. And in terms of technology, automation technologies to reduce labor needs and increase the digitalization, better data integration and sharing, and more and better broadband access and connectivity. We will make uh, some of those, uh, um, the results of the survey available. And um, I think it's important to note that respondents also talked about um, the role of the government and they believe that the role of the government will be uh, to, to, to fund 
um, uh, uh, build capacity and spearhead prog programs targeting research and innovation in the sector. So I'm pleased to, to, to know that we, we have a number of uh, representatives from, uh, uh, from different uh, uh, organizations here. Um, we have uh, uh, Denise from the NRC. We have uh, Gilles Sandon, the Assistant Deputy Minister from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, so we, we, we are well represented in, in, uh, in a number of uh, groups. So let me now introduce the, the panelists. And, and, um, um, and um, once I uh, give uh, Alison the, 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 um, the go ahead, um, she will uh, speak and then Keith uh, will speak after her. Uh, it'll be a seamless transition until I come back for the Q&A session at the end. Um, uh, each speaker will, when they stop, the other one will take over. So Alison Sundstrom is our first uh, panelist. She's founder and CEO of uh, CNR, CNS RVX. Uh, Keith Curry is president of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Denise Allen is president and CEO of Food Processors Canada. Jitendra Sagili is Chief Research and Development and Food Technology Officer at Maple Leaf Foods. Jeff Hall is a Food Safety Specialist at the Canadian Produce Marketing Association. Bill Gruel is a CEO of Protein Industries Canada. Dr. Stan Blaine, Blade is the Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environment, Environment at the University of uh, Alberta. And Troy Taylor is the Vice President of Operations at Restaurants Canada. We wanted to give you a really broad range of uh, speakers from all the, what we call the World Food System. And the World Food System, which we consider and we are involved in now as AIC, is really from, from uh, production to consumption and even um, uh, uh, waste uh, after consumption. So we wanted to give you a broad range of perspectives, and I think we have. Uh, as uh, uh, Julien indicated, there will be a Q&A uh, session after. So if you have questions, please type it, type the questions uh, um, in, in the Q&A box and uh, people will be able to vote on the questions uh, to, um, to make them uh, 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 more or less, uh, 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 well, more, I guess, um, uh, relevant for everybody. And uh, I'll, I'll choose the questions first from that uh, section. And then we'll open it up to whoever wants to ask a question as well. And we'll ask them for you to raise your hand uh, but that will ha not happen until 2.45 p.m. Uh, Eastern. So the questions will be relegated to the end of the presentation. So Alison, if I can uh, invite you to, uh, to, to speak. Thank you, Serge. Um, it's an honor to present today, especially amongst uh, so many colleagues. Serge, I think you covered just about everything that uh, could be covered in terms of COVID-19. Uh, just a little bit of background to myself. Um, I built and successfully divested a data analytics business, improving efficiency in animal agriculture. And I must say to Denise that if I had not had NRC IRAP and uh, the support that I found in your program, I don't think we would have been a successful exit. Uh, I'm currently invested in a company that's uh, looking at blockchain solutions in agriculture. I had the pleasure in 2016 of serving on the economic strategy table for agri-food. And I will say that I came away with um, an amazing belief that agriculture in Canada can grow at a much faster rate up until we reached COVID. Uh, one of the things that I found is that the funding and financing ecosystem for science-based companies was extremely thin in Canada. So one of the things that I have been doing is working on improving the ecosystem. And I have become a founding partner and fellow at the Creative Destruction Lab. The Creative Destruction Lab is a program for seed stage, massively scalable science-based companies. Since 2012, over a thousand founders representing more than 500 companies have participated. And the successful commercialization of cutting edge technology and science through this program has led to the creation of over four and a half billion in equity value. I think this is gonna be important in our discussion today. I'm also a venture partner at Builders BC out of San Francisco with an office in Calgary and an investment team member of the 51, which is a women led investment uh, collective. I think it would be fair to say that the future is not what it used to be. We are now living in a world where 93% of our countries have closed borders 
and new entry limits and what our access to trade is going to be is going to be up to anyone's, anyone's guess. Governments have become the insurer and payer of last resort. The policy will likely ensure in the future, future ag policy will likely ensure resiliency and perhaps bring with it more oversight, higher taxes, less services and more regulation. Myself, I think the supply chains have changed forever. Just in time is probably gone. Resiliency will become as important to our supply chains as, as cost and efficiency has and local over global is solidifying. And for a country with ag exports like Canada, what is that going to mean to us? We're going to be looking for domestic sourcing and supply. We're really seeing changing industry structures, consumer behavior and market position. One of the interesting things when you look at what's happened in uh, the, the post COVID or what will happen in the post COVID world is that over the last three recessions over the past 30 years, automation has increased. And for agri-food, which is looking at um, risks and skilled labor shortages, I think that's gonna be a positive thing. We are moving into a uh, contact-free economy, digital commerce, telemedicine, and automation. I, I think you'll hear, and automation, automation, automation throughout my comments today. And we're seeing a shift in policy. We need to shift from the era of traditional infrastructure where in agriculture that meant feed supply processing investments in hardcore. We now have to shift to an era of intangibles, digital IP strategies, perhaps uh, data trusts, in large industries like agriculture. So we are going to see a shift. I've been asked today to comment on what areas of research I think we need to invest in and Surge covered so many of them. It, it was very interesting to me that the comments we heard back were all about digitization, investment, government support, government financing. I really think that we're entering a new era of public and private partnership. And perhaps that's going to be the greater success for, for us as we look to innovations. Digital strategy is going to become the area that we must focus on in Canada. We need to improve our broadband. We need to improve our investment in mechanization and automation. And I think if we look at the strategies or the research strategies, we need to improve crop breeding to boost yields. We need to improve soil and water management. These investments that we make today can steer the future in a more sustainable way, and it will help us build a more prosperous country. Uh, I believe that improving animal efficiency is something that I spent 18 years of my life on. I believe that that is, a, that is where we also have to emphasize. And in terms of animal efficiency and in our chase to find alternative proteins, I think that we have to look at animal agriculture in a new light and consider that ruminant animals actually are creating and using uh, bioresources that other animals and other sources of proteins may not. So that's one area that I would like to look at. However, I'd also like to see the, an increase in livestock and pasture productivity. We have to face the fact that livestock and animal agriculture are affecting our environment and we have to find and invest in strategies to change that. We need to improve manure management and we need to reduce food waste. I think through COVID, we have seen an unprecedented level of waste in our food supply system. We've also seen an unprecedented level of stress on our farms and ranchers. And this is an area that we must uh, emphasize. Agriculture has been growing. GDP rose from 11% from 2012 to 2016, whereas in comparison, the Canadian economy only grew by 7.8% over the same time period. I think agriculture is an area that we must invest in. In terms of technology, Surge did cover 
a wide variety of the technologies. I think there's three areas we have to focus on. Uh, biotechnology in terms of plant and animal genetics, uh, looking at the microbiome, automated phenotyping methods, genetic editing and replication, and cultured tissue, which is part of the plant protein uh, go forward. I think that there's opportunity in Canada for alternative feeds and additives, fertilizers, pest management, and going back again to sort of my area of investigation is we must look at mechanizing our farms and food processing more so. Investments in cobotics and robotics, 3D printing on farm, autonomous vehicles. And I also think that focusing on bioenergy and waste. Basically, I think quality and safety and e-commerce, new packaging, there's just a wide range of strategies that we can invest in. So thank you for allowing me to speak today, Serge. Thank you, Keith, you're next. There we go, I have to get myself off mute, which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> I guess I should, have, uh, I should have connected with Allison first because uh, many of the things that she talked about at a higher level, there's certainly things that I was going to point out, but um, you know, it was interesting uh, as we go through COVID-19, the agriculture, the primary agricultural world in here in Canada, our farmers and ranchers were already under a little bit of stress from 2019. Uh, certainly we had some weather issues, both the beginning of the year and the end of the year, and it varied depending on where you were in the country. Um, but also we were dealing with the geopolitics of the day. Certainly the trade issues with China did not help uh, our markets for uh, canola, soybeans, beef, pork. Um, it, it certainly affected a lot of our, our farmers from a financial, stressful financial way. And then you throw in uh, a rail blockage at the end of the year and then one beginning of this year, uh, which uh, slowed up product or in some cases had product sitting on cars rotting and, and going to waste and producers not getting covered for those. So coming into, into early March, there was some stress uh, certainly be already being experienced by our farm community. But like we do uh, as farmers, uh, spring was right around the corner. We're the eternal optimist. We were looking forward to this year because it's always better than last year. That's just the way we think. And then of course, COVID-19, uh, we watch it come from overseas into Canada. And, and like everyone else in society, we really don't know what that was going to mean for us uh, coming into this. So, so certainly as we began down the road of COVID and things began shutting down, it didn't immediately affect our, our farm community too much. Uh, probably first up uh, from, a, from a, a nervous standpoint from the farm community was our horse sector uh, in the fact that we re do rely on a lot of migrant workers, so, uh, foreign labor. Generally speaking in Canada, there's nearly 60,000 foreign workers come in each and every year to help us with the planting, the maintenance, the growing season and the harvest uh, of our products, along with uh, a number of them also uh, being in the, in the processing side as well. Uh, they are, do play a very important role in the processing sector too, so I don't want to uh, admit that from, uh, or uh, leave that out from what I'm, what I'm saying, but you know, we did get the go ahead from the government to uh, get the exemption to allow them to come in. It was in a case of uh, negotiating with foreign countries to make sure that they would give permission for these, these people to come, but again, that put more financial burden on our, on our hort producers because uh, that was at a cost. That was nearly $1,250 per worker or just to, to charter planes to get them here. Uh, then we had to quarantine them and then also have to pay them 30 hours per week uh, uh, wages during that quarantine period. Um, it was interesting, Denise off the top, talking about uh, having a good relationship with AFC and getting good funding. Um, I think if you talk to any farmer today, they might argue that that's not the case for, for primary agriculture. Uh, in today's world of going through COVID-19, uh, while there are some nice announcements, $50 million for, uh, for the foreign worker help that I mentioned, but that's about $1,500 a worker. And if you take 1250 out of that just to charter them to get here, that doesn't leave much for wages for two weeks and social distancing protocols that, that we have to put in place, extra, uh, extra bunk houses, extra hotels, bringing in campers and trailers. So it's all at an added cost. And it's a cost we can't recover. Our margins are very tight as it is. And, and really, I think what we're, we're discovering now as I work through, through you know, three months of this, 
uh, we're seeing how connected the entire value chain is. And although I represent primary agriculture both here and in, Can in Ontario and in Canada, uh, we are very much connected with uh, with the whole value chain. We've heard a lot about processing. And I know you've got people that'll touch on that, and even the retail side. But we also can't forget the transportation sector, uh, to and from farm, to and from processors, but also those that deliver services to us on the farm as well. So uh, very much connected and very much uh, as it began to see things like absenteeism and people not coming to work because they're afraid uh, of getting sick, really did have start to have an impact on our sectors. We've all heard the stories about uh, the processing plants in the meat sector shutting down. And it's going to be a long, long time before they get up to any any sense of uh, semblance of, of normalcy going forward. Uh, the protocols that are in place are all about uh, worker protection, whether that's barriers, slowing lines down, PPEs, etc. Uh, but that's not going to allow for full production what these plants are used to. So it's going to see a backlog of animals for quite some time, and that is causing a lot of stress to our primary producers, our farmers, and our ranchers out there. Um, especially if you look at the beef and the pork, or the sorry, the pork and the poultry sector, uh, beef beef has been uh, held up in Eastern Canada. We've had a massive capacity problem of processing for quite some time, and that's now being exasperated. But you know, with the right measures and the right tools in place, the, those animals can be held back for a lot longer time than pork and poultry can, and, and eggs can only last so long. So we're we're destroying eggs. We're having to euthanize animals because we have nowhere to put them, they have nowhere to go, and these farmers are losing an income. They're losing on uh, you know, what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, they're build, die, uh, diving into their equity to try and keep their heads above water. And you know, We're really struggling with the federal government not recognizing the need just to keep this food production system uh, going strong. And, and that's part of the issue that we've had is that really we wanna see not made whole, we understand we're all gonna pay a price for this, but, but keep this system as whole as you can make it because what we're going to have post COVID-19 is one of the very few, if not the only industry that's going to hit the ground running and is going to be that economic recovery uh, industry that's going to take off uh, right from the start because food production is something that's still going to happen. It was interesting listening to Serge talk about some of the, uh, some of the survey results about, about food security in general and how we need to make sure that we, we have food for ourselves. We are not ever going to run out of food because we're a massive export nation. Well, selection will be less, prices will be high. Yes, we're already seeing that. Uh, the, the selection that we're seeing on the shelves predominantly right now is either a combination of the hoard buying, changes in buying habit because people are now cooking and, and baking at home, uh, and some countries that are, are closing their borders. Uh, rice is in, in scarce supply right now because because the Asian nations that supply a lot of rice have, have closed their borders. So we're seeing a few products like that that are, that are slowing down. But in general terms, we, are, we, are, uh, we have a very robust system when it's functioning and uh, we are a massive food producer. So I think, you know, from the moral obligation of feeding the world, uh, it's something we need to do. Um, certainly uh, food waste is something we need to continue to look at. But it's a rich world, country, uh, rich country problem. Uh, you get into countries that are poor and don't have a lot of food selection. There is no food waste. They're hungry and they eat everything. So we need to figure out how to, how to work with that. How do we, how do we, uh, as I also said, improve our genetics? Whether that's being able to have longer shelf life for certain products, whether we can uh, store them longer. Part of our issue around food banks right now isn't the fact that people want to donate food that they can't get to market to food banks. It's the fact that food banks don't have storage. They don't have cooler space. They don't have freezer space. They can't certainly can't handle live animals. So we need to figure out how we can we can up the ante for things like food banks as well. And you know we've we've been affected by a lot of the shutdowns out there now. The restaurant industry, which I know we're just going to be for, uh, speakers on that, but it's greatly affected a lot of people in our horse sector who grow for the summer, package, store for the winter, and now that market's gone. You know, well, mushrooms is a prime example. There's some $400,000 worth of mushrooms a week that's that's not going into the restaurant sector. So I live about an hour north of uh, Holland Marsh. It's a terrible salad bowl. Um, they've cut back production by at least 30 to 40% because A, they don't have enough foreign labor to get in to get to get it planted, and B, they're not sure the market's gonna be there, uh, you know, coming out, of, coming out of this. It's gonna be a while probably for the restaurant community um, 
re, re, gets himself to gets her feet under, under the ground. So we really are, are right across the board feeling some kind of suffering. Our ornamental sector, uh, biggest season for them is, is uh, April, Easter to Mother's Day. That's about 60% of their business. So they're talking about a billion dollars worth of lost product just, just from that season alone. So how do you recoup that kind of money? Can we, you know, there's no way to, there's no way to change plant genetics to, to change retail sales. So these are kinds of things that we need programming for governments to step up to make sure that we keep these industries going. Um, most people don't think of the equine sector as agriculture, but there's hundreds of thousands of horses across this country that are in dire strait right now with all the riding stables shut down, the boarding stables, the race tracks are shut down. Uh, these folks are a big part of agriculture and, and uh, people just don't have the money to pay the bills to board horses or to feed them and look after them or pay for riding lessons or even, even the, the um, extra money people have that they would spend on, on paramutual wagering is gone and that's revenue into those into the horse sector that greatly affects those of us that supply feed and bedding to horses so it's a, it's a huge industry that's 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 gone lost aquaculture has also been neglected through this uh, they're certainly hurting me very much so we really are looking to our government to step up here and and help us out. Um, it was interesting listening to Allison talk about uh, the environmental aspects of things and I really think some of our research really needs to go into uh, in particular soil health. Uh, that's an area that's going to, going to not only affect primary agriculture from the growing, nutrient retention, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, just water solubility and where that plays in the large as well is, is in the climate change factor. Uh, the biggest expenditure we have right now to climate change is fixing the problems from severe weather storms. But imagine if we had a stronger health, uh, soil health structure and stronger environmental initiatives back on the farms and in the forestry areas where the majority of our carbon is sequestered. Think about the, the, uh, the mitigation that we could take place. It's not costing municipalities and provincial governments and federal governments millions and billions of dollars to repair issues from, from severe weather, weather storms. And, and certainly farmers have shown over the years through our environmental farm plans and other stewardship initiatives that we're willing to put money into it, but we can't be expected to do it all in our financial back. So how can we do the research and create the funding uh, to do those kinds of initiatives that are gonna benefit the planet long-term, it's gonna benefit the soil long-term, it's gonna benefit the farmer long-term, and ultimately the consumer in general, because it's gonna be for healthier production, it's gonna be for more robust production. Uh, but at the end of the day, it still comes down to dollars and cents. And um, you know, farmers are, 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 are price takers, we're not price setters. And, and we need the entire system to understand and consumers to understand that we really do have cheap food. 10% of our, our annual salaries goes to food uh, purchases for the year so it's really not a lot of money so but how does the farmer extract enough to keep cost of production uh, levels at least on the farm uh, and that's that's an issue that we have to deal with um, certainly uh, we're not going we never expected to come out of COVID-19 unscathed we're unscathed we're like everyone else but as I mentioned earlier, we do see a real opportunity uh, for us to hit the ground running and be the economic recovery industry that, that will really drive the recovery of the economy. Uh, but going forward, the precision technology that's that's on the farm right now is incredible. Uh, we'd like to do more, uh, as, as Allison alluded to. Um, the biggest stumbling block right now is our broadband infrastructure in particular. Uh, I don't know if I froze a number of times with you folks, but I've done a lot of Zoom calls over the last few months and uh, my internet's not great. And I'd love to use a lot more tools on my own farm, but uh, unfortunately the broadband's not there for me to, for me to do it. And, and, and in 2020, uh, broadband is everything. I mean, it's, it's how we move things. Uh, also, what, what I didn't hear mentioned and something I think is very, very, uh, very important going forward is that whole education piece right across the value chain system. Um, I can use persistent technology, don't ask me to fix it. We need the skill levels in all kinds of areas through persistent technology to help the farm community to run this equipment, to rewrite software, to build new equipment, um, and to go forward through all aspects of our, our entire value chain. And I think there's an education piece out there because labor is a huge issue right across the value chain, but in particular in agriculture as well. Even with the 60,000 foreign workers we get each and every year, we're still probably 15 to 16,000 positions on farm that go unfilled every year. So, so that education piece on the opportunities in agriculture is something that we just need to do more of. We need to get that out there. And, and probably lastly, before I get rambling on too long, the other uh, aspect I'd like to see maybe some, some potential uh, uh, research into is 
is, is more biosecurity uh, protocols for, for those, on the, those of us on the farm and through the entire value chain. Most of our, our uh, commodities do have extremely good uh, quality assurance type of programs, biosecurity uh, protocols in place. But do we need to start looking into ways that we design, redesign our facilities, whether it's buildings or greenhouses or whatever type of facility, to minimize the contact points from the from the outside coming in? If you're a livestock producer, when the truck comes in, do I just need to move some gates and out the door goes the goes the animal into the truck and nobody gets out, nobody touches it? Uh, if it's if it's other produce, how do we minimize that contact point? Which was one of the stumbling blocks we were having with uh, with. COVID, quite frankly, is, is people were afraid of, of people coming into, into the farm, into the pro, uh, producing area, and, and having that added contact point. So are there areas we can do to, to improve our biosecurity issues as well, to make sure that we minimize, not only for something like COVID, but you know we've had to deal with avian influenza, we've had to deal with African swine fever and the prevention of those diseases, and who knows what the next one will be. So how do we make our workers feel safe so they're confident to come to work so we have less absenteeism? And how do we make sure that our farming operations also feel safe that even though we need these services to come onto a farm, how do we make them safer for us? So uh, I'm gonna give yeah. you a few I'm gonna give you a few more seconds. Yeah, I was just no, I'm done, sir. Sorry, like I said, I, I can go on and on for days, but uh, I'm gonna leave it at that and I'll leave it to the question and answer later. But thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate being here. Denise. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I'm, I'm coming to you uh, under uh, difficult internet circumstances, but uh, from the beautiful island of Cape Breton on the Atlantic coast today, it's a foggy, rainy day, but don't feel too bad for me because I am having lobster for supper. So uh, thank you for having me very much today. I'm uh, very happy to be here among such a strong set of panelists. Um, when preparing for today, I, I felt it best, uh, the most relevant and timely thing I could share with you is a recent uh, submission uh, that I've made to the Standing Committee on Finance. Um, and from, that, uh, from this discussion, I think it's going to dovetail nicely into some of the other uh, panelists and hopefully we'll get some good uh, Q&A. And, and uh, again, I thank the panelists for a very robust discussion so far. So thank you again for the opportunity to participate in Agri-Food Innovation Council's um, uh, virtual or web um, webinar today. I'm Denise Allen. I'm the president and CEO of Food Processors of Canada. And for more than 30 years, Food Processors of Canada has been the trusted leading national voice of the Canadian food and beverage processing sector. Today, we find ourselves in uncharted territory. We have accepted that our future is irreversibly changed by the prolonged effects of this crisis and that this folk has forced us all in both business and our daily lives to consider the interconnectedness of our societal, food and economic systems. The following discussion is intended to respectfully inform you of the impending risks we observe in our food value chain and to offer a suggestion on how to offset the possibility that if the issue of liquidity is left unaddressed, food shortages and food price inflation will be more severe than necessary. Again, the purpose of our discussion today is to highlight the enhanced credit risk that the food service sector has imposed on food and beverage processors during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as to inform you uh, the extent of the incremental costs uh, imposed on food processors to sustainably produce during the crisis. Since early March, the COVID-19 pandemic has placed extraordinary strain on our entire supply chain. During this time, food processors have continued to manufacture safe, high quality products under a difficult set of circumstances, which include reduced operating capacity and sales, higher operating costs and wages, employee absenteeism, sourcing of personal protective equipment and other measures to ensure factories remain open while simultaneously safeguarding our employees' health. These changes to our operating procedures are taking place under a backdrop of daily changing public health announcement announcements and a nationwide state of emergency. The disruption to the food sector in Canada has left certain sectors of our economy devastated and struggling to see a clear path to reopening our economy. This prolonged disruption is marked like no other in our history and bears a, com a combination of unique characteristics which will require remediation to ensure food products continue to flow uninterrupted to consumers. Protecting the flow of goods to our food services sector, as well as we don't, will demonstrate, will help, dem uh, sorry, will help maintain the public's confidence in our ability to provide a wide range of consumer goods and meet the demand for safe and reliable food products for Canadian families. Our sector's commitment to produce 
essential products for Canadians during our crisis remain strong. As we look forward, we recognize that social distancing rules will remain in effect for the foreseeable future. This enormous change to how we plan and run our businesses day to day will have an ongoing effect on productivity and profitability, and has therefore forced us to broaden our analysis and risk mitigation plans to include the interconnected parts of our food system. Our member companies continue to shoulder tremendous strain as we focus on the health and well being of employees while maintaining the strength of Canada's food supply chain. A return to a steadier economic state will require the recognition and support for the incremental expenses beyond PPE incurred to date, as well as a recognition of future financial risk in the form of liquidity in one of our two important selling channels, the food service sector. Our government's recent announcement that it will provide targeted support to farmers, ranchers, agricultural producers, and food processors by creating the Emergency Processing Fund to help food producers access more personal protective equipment, adapt to health protocols, automate and modernize their facilities, processes, and operations, and respond to emerging pressures from COVID-19 is welcomed support. However, this pool of funds is inadequate to cover the added operational burden of not only PPE, but other incremental costs to ensure the safety of our frontline workers and to meet increased demand from retailers. Through the collection of source data from, the biz from our businesses currently adapting their business environment, we have extrapolated an estimate of approximately 1 billion in added operating expense assumed by food processors alone. FPCs welcomes the assistance and support offered through the Emergency Processors Fund. However, we respectfully ask, that consideration is given to expand this fund to offset the financial burden being shouldered by the food and beverage processing sector beyond that of PPE. We are therefore looking for a solution for our members to help offset the costs of COVID-19 as we work to establish the new normal. The credit risk posed by the devastation in the food service sector, primarily independent restaurants, presents significant risk to the efficient workings of the entire Canadian food supply. Recently, the government announced a rent subsidy program, the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance, or CECRA, for independent businesses, which responds to one of the greatest challenges for independent restaurants. However, the sector is reporting low uptake of the benefits as the program requires landlord participation, is reported as being too complicated, and is administratively burdensome. Through no fault of their own, many independent restaurants will be unable to secure any protection or relief through this mechanism. More worrisome is the working capital requirements to restock inventories, which will exceed that of rent default risk. The failure rates of independent restaurants are expected to be, expected to be significant. We have consulted with Restaurants Canada to highlight issues and bring forward recommendations which will help stabilize the flow of goods as the supply chain for food service restarts. However, reduced capacity means reduced profitability in a sector whose operating margins are incredibly thin under normal economic conditions. With little to no sales revenue, many have exhausted any pre-existing reserve funds. Further exacerbating these financial circumstances is the perishable nature of their inventories combined with the debt owed to food distributors for orders placed in February. And as many as four months rent, their largest fixed expense is currently in arrears. Uh, considering the low uptake in the rent subsidy program, this situation is expected to worsen and remain for minimally a year before stabilization is possible. The retail sector, however, remains buoyant with little to no liquidity issues reported. Retailers currently have sufficient cash flow to pay food processors within established payment terms. By contrast, the food service sector has seen a significant erosion of sales, which presents liquidity risk in the second major selling channel for food processors and primary producers. This liquidity risk is severe and compounded by rent and other debt, low operating margins and shortened cash cycles. A large majority of restaurants have had to shutter their operations completely in March and will remain closed until the end of May. While some restaurants have been able to offer takeout service during the crisis, they have also incurred the corresponding expense to remain open and therefore have not been able to pay down debt. Their liquidity problem is not simply timing, but an inability to generate cash from operations or borrow significant funds to replenish inventories re required to reopen. This gap in liquidity is occurring near the top of the supply chain, which is determined by the exchange of goods and services between restaurants and food distributors. When examining, examining the total food supply chain, it is apparent that many independent operators in this sector will not be able to honor past food orders and settle rent debt through further borrowing or sales. Unless independent restaurants can secure a source of funding in the form of long-term financing or grants, 
their debt, rent debt alone will be a significant detriment to their ability to open profitably. Sadly, many will not reopen at all. This gap translate into significant accounts receivable risk for both food distributors and food processors. One lever to offer, offset this receivables risk is to shorten payment terms and move to cash on delivery terms or COD. The largest fixed expense for restaurants, again, is rent. Uh, since rent is normally paid in advance or the beginning of the month, many have not paid March, April, now May's rent. Without immediate remedy, food distributors will not extend further credit to their restaurant customers based on this restriction to working capital. Without cash flows to distributors from restaurants, the independent nature of the total supply chain will be forced to make required changes to credit, credit terms, many opting to move to cash on delivery or COD terms to offset this payment risk. The backbone of the Canadian food supply chain is our farmers. The agricultural sector is the base producer for food of food for both selling channels. The liquidity issue presented by the food service sector as one of our two major selling channels will impact the agricultural sector's ability to see their products safely and effectively reach the consumer market. Many primary producers are now reporting that certain labor intensive cross, crops will not be planted at all due to this uncertainty and other compounding factors facing farmers. Our collective ability to focus on the total food system and supply chain in Canada will ultimately determine our ability to avoid product shortages, holes in retail shelves, and severe price inflation, which will disproportionately affect those most economically vulnerable. There needs to be an injection of working capital in one of our two critical selling channels and backstop this credit risk posed by the food service sector and ensure that product continues to flow unfettered while protecting the small Canadian business owner. And I believe that, blink, that brings me to uh, 10 minutes. So I'll stop now and uh, pass the baton on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, having me, uh, everyone. It's a great panel. Uh, I'm gaining a lot of uh, insight. Um, to me, uh, my name is Jitendra Sageli. Um, I am uh, Chief R&D and Food Technology Officer for Maple Leaf Foods. Uh, in my role, I oversee uh, research development of uh, and culinary uh, development, packaging, processing of the entire enterprise for all the proteins, both plant protein and animal protein for, for, for our company. So um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be, as Alison was mentioning as well, it's an honor to be uh, in the part of this uh, panel. Um, you know, um, you know, I, you know on, from, from an industry perspective, from the Maple Leaf Foods, our industry perspective, listening to all of this, uh, it's amazing because, um, you know, to me, um, you know, we, we often talk about, you know, someone commented about the food ecosystem and uh, we often talk about uh, farm to fork. The way I see it um, moving forward, it's a reverse of, we have to reimagine this food ecosystem. It's like fork to farm. How consumer behavior is changing and at the fork, Tendra, I think you're you're frozen right now. I'm gonna give it a couple of seconds. Sorry guys, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I apologize. Uh, probably bad connection. Um, you know the way the the reason why you know like I'm what I'm talking about is about um, instead of farm to fork. It's time for all of us to think about fork to farm. How do we um, reimagine the entire uh, supply chain ecosystem, our food ecosystem that can be more resilient, um, that has got the maximum productivity, you know, like um, Keith, you mentioned about the beef and pork, um, the farmers and at the restaurant side, you know, you got certain, certain, certain in the restaurants, um, and, and maximum productivity of both plant protein and, and animal protein. Um, these are the things that, um, you know, we talk about food security versus food waste. You know, we have enough potential to produce a lot of food, but how do we preserve it? You know, what are the processing, te enhanced processing techniques or, you know, what, you know uh, it, the research we need to focus on. Um, the, the farmers, you know, that are losing a lot on the milk or eggs, how do we process that further, make it like, you know, an example is create an egg powder that you can reconstitute back, um, you know, to, to, to restaurants, you know, like, like I, think, I think the fork area of focus on how we use 
um, are, are process this for consumer acceptance um, is the research should be focused on, 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 on that um, in my view. Uh, and uh, you know, we talked about the biotechnology aspect of it. Um, there is a term um, that's um, I'm sure most of you heard about it is called a synthetic biology. It is, it is what that's you know, creating all like it's a term but it, it also encompass, encompasses all the technologies we are talking about, whether it's biotechnology, precision agriculture, all of this. The synthetic biology has been used by pharma industries or biofuels for a long time, but the, the scale or economy was like unattainable for food production. Now, at this, now we are at a, like an amazing juncture to utilize these technologies to make some of these products are are you know to to reimagine these distribution systems, um, and, and you know even the packaging uh, portion of it, the the you know uh, finished product portion of it, um, you know what from from our side in the maple leaf side you know we are um, you know for me at the end of the day the consumer behavior consumer acceptance the taste you know no matter how many processes we make how many um, you know uh, versions or formats we develop the taste is the key the Acceptance is, comes to the end product that is the taste, and the consumer, uh, you know, consumer need to see that. So that's that's uh, um, you know, and you know, another another important area for us is the partnership. You know, we are working with NRC. Um, we just started the partnership with NRC on the on, on certain things, and we are working to minimize the supply chain to uh, to to have localized solutions in Canada. Um, and also, you know, we are working with a lot of organizations to have common knowledge sharing of a lot of, you know, unknowns we are seeing, you know, in, in this uh, supply chain system and, and, and the new technologies. Um, and, and, you know, finally, like, you know, uh, th this, this is sure um, a pivotal moment for, for the entire industry, to be honest, and how we, um, you know, how we treat the technologies and how we adapt uh, to to uh, the the environmental, uh, human and natural interventions in the food ecosystem. So that that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jitendra. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Hall. I am the uh, food safety specialist with the uh, Canadian Produce Marketing Association. Uh, unfortunately, Ron Lemaire, our president, wasn't able to make it, uh, but he does uh, send his, his greetings as well. Um, CPMA would like to thank the Agri-Food Innovation Council for spearheading the discussion around innovation and research and what the world looks like post COVID-19. CPMA represents approximately 860 growers, packers, wholesalers, distributors, ah. retailers, food service, and related support industries across Canada, the US and internationally. Approximately 90% of the fresh fruits and vegetables consumed in Canada have moved through one or more of our members. CPA mem CPMA members have directed us to engage in numerous areas of research and innovation to ensure they have access to the latest technologies and operational procedures for their businesses. The fresh fruit and vegetable industry across North America actively partners with academia, government, Private, private technology organizations and like-minded business sectors to understand and develop solutions to challenges facing the industry. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all areas of the fresh fruit and, vi and vegetable business, including how farmers are managing their season, labor shortages, shortages resulting from travel bans, the decline, of, the decline of food service, and changing consumer habits at retail. And we've already heard a lot of those discussed so far this, this afternoon. Um, there is no segment of the fresh fruit and, and vegetable supply chain, which has been left untouched by this crisis. CPMA would also like to recognize the strain this crisis has placed on all levels of government and would like to thank them for their efforts. As a national organization, CPMA has been participating on the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Public Safety Canada Critical Infrastructure, and other government-initiated communication sessions. Over the past few months, we have encouraged members to provide their information via surveys to help government understand the current needs of industry and future requirements. As noted previously, our members have directed CFA, excuse me, have directed CPMA 
to engage in a number of innovation and research projects. And I would just like to touch on a few of them now and kind of how COVID has, uh, has impacted them. One of the key things that's come up over the last number of years has to do with artificial intelligence. AI has the potential to trigger a seismic shift in how farms, processing facilities, and supply chains interconnect in the future. The amount of data being generated along the supply chain is increasing at an exponential rate. AI will have the power to take the data and process it into information. Data on factors such as weather patterns, soil moisture readings, transportation trends, storage temperatures, etc., will feed into systems which optimize returns and minimize waste within the food supply. In addition to the tangible benefits, AI will allow consumer trends to be quickly identified and responded to. Monitoring, categorizing, and prioritizing data gleaned from social networks will help inform retailers who can place orders in anticipation of a growing consumer trend. That particular fruit, a consumer mentioned online a few days before, will magically appear at their local grocer. COVID has hastened this change as consumers have flocked to online resources for everything food related. Many who had been hesitant before will now use the internet regularly, especially for the basics. In-store shopping will need to become an experience to draw consumers and the associated AI systems will ensure these exciting products are available, the ones they are looking for. Someone had previously mentioned uh, robotics and, and, and technology. Um, the produce industry has always been labor intensive. So efficiencies with, which can be gained through automation or improved technologies are continuously being developed. The travel bans imposed by countries as a re result of COVID have put a spotlight on the weak link, which is a reliance on foreign labor. Although some domestic labor is used in the industry, many employers find it difficult to fill positions with local workers, given the nature of the work which is required. Even now, with unemployment rates rising, domestic labor is difficult to procure. What's in interesting is this is not only a North American issue, but one affecting many developed countries who also rely on foreign employees. Process efficiencies and the in introduction of new technologies will be a key driver in the agri-food sector for years to come. Innovation, innovative organizations who understand the needs of businesses and how technology can help will prosper. Supporting industries which engineer, build, and create software for those organizations will also do very well. This shift from manual tasks to technology-driven solutions will reduce the need for seasonal workforces and increase demand for highly skilled individuals to, to design and maintain the new technologies. One of the critical lessons we've learned from COVID-19 pandemic is how fragile the food supply chains are and how we must create flexibility and resiliency within the system. This has been demonstrated in the most demoralizing way in situations where markets traditionally fed by a system of storage or surplus product has dried up. The result is an excess of product. Two, two classic examples we've seen here in Canada so far. Um, are the, uh, are the uh, excess potatoes, which had been destined to become frozen French fries, but unfortunately now are beginning to rot in storage. And of course, I think it was already mentioned here, um, hogs, which have become too large for processing and have to be euthanized. Systems need to be developed, which can direct in a timely manner, excess product to in need communities. This is a challenging issue given the geographic and climactic diversity within Canada and the multitude of socioeconomic communities contained within. A number of the issues we were dealing with previously have not gone away. And one of these, of course, is, is plastics. COVID has spurred consumers back towards fruit, fret, fruit, fresh fruit and vegetable packaged in plastic. This is undoubtedly a self-defense reaction to protect themselves from contracting COVID-19 from products other consumers may have handled. And although we expect this behavior to continue over the short to medium term, term plastics will once, it began, once again become a topic of conversation and concern. CPA, CPMA has led a, a project to better understand the role of plastics in the, in the produce industry. 
Packaging is a primary source of plastics in the industry, but it is a small percentage, less than 2% of the overall plastic packaging used in Canada. The types of plastic, pros and cons of each, and the recyclability has also been studied. PET and recycled PTE, sorry, PET, are the most commonly used plastics, and they are also the most useful from a, recyc from a recycling perspective, as they retain their structural and hand handling properties, even after repeated rework. Post-COVID, government and industry must look at how research, innovation, and regulations can be leveraged to create a truly circular plastics economy, which is both profitable and environmentally sustainable. One of CPMA's recent projects um, in the last couple of years has been the development of the Canadian Food Safety Fund. The fund has been set up to support research, education, and related food safety activities applicable to the produce industry. Currently, we are funding four research projects from various institutions across Canada. From the University of Guelph, Professor Keith Warner is investigating how sanitize, sanitizer efficacy can be managed, managed through processing to reduce the amounts released in effluent, in facility effluent. Dr. Claudia Navarez from the University of Manitoba is using bacterial phages to reduce the level of pathogenic E. coli on leafy green plants. The goal to create a targeted phage mix, which can be applied to the plants which significantly reduces the E. coli load while leaving, leaving the surrounding environment unaffected. Dr. Liu from UBC is working on a test kit to rapidly detect salmonella on plant surfaces. And our final project is being headed by Dr. Professor, excuse me, Professor Juliette Jean from the University of Laval, who is studying how to de deactivate viruses, uh, norovirus and hepatitis A in particular, using pulse light on various types of berries. Although COVID-19 is not a foodborne contaminant, its societal, societal effects have resulted in the closure and thus the suspension of all lab-based university projects. CPMA had plans to issue another request for projects in 2020, but this is also on hold under, until the university's labs can open. Even then, the social distancing requirements will, will, which will be imposed may re reduce the lab efficiencies, therefore increasing timeframes of laboratory studies. This will not be isolated to the food safety research, but will affect the research community in general. And finally, we'd like to touch on um, some of the changes with respect to consumers um, and, and hopefully to end on, on an up note. One of the interesting aspects of the COVID pandemic is the increased interest in home cooking. Whether it's a lack of traditional restaurant access or the newfound time many, many have as a result of working from home, Consumers have begun to experiment and experience cooking from scratch. Who would have predicted that sourdough bread making would replace cat videos on social media? This trend is one companies can leverage in a number of ways. By understanding the growing trends, companies can produce brand specific social media content, such as online cooking seminars to help consumers expand that experience. The sensory, sensory properties of taste, texture, smell, and color of new produce can be highlighted and consumers can be encouraged to seek out and try product they may not have in the past. A little human ingenuity partnered with the innovative products and programs being cre created will help us come through this COVID-19 pandemic with a fresh outlook and many new opportunities. Thank you and I'm happy to take any questions uh, at the end or if I don't have an answer I'm happy to take it back to Ron for a response. Thank you. Good, thanks. I, I think I'm up next. My name is Bill Gould. I'm CEO of Protein Industries Canada, and I'm in sunny Regina today. So Protein Industries Canada, we are one of Canada's five super clusters, and our goal is to grow the value-added processing sector for crops in Canada. And together with our partners, we're investing $300 million in support of that goal. We know that there's significant uh, opportunity to grow Canada's share of the global plant protein market, and uh, that is as true in the post-COVID era as it was prior. So I think what I'll do today is draw a little bit on some of the issues and challenges that our members are facing. This is derived from a survey that we did with our members uh, shortly after uh, COVID-19 in early April. 
and a number of ongoing discussions that we've had with our members. And I think what we're seeing as the backdrop to my thoughts in terms of the changes for R&D is really uh, three areas that our members are facing and then a fourth trend that I'll just touch on before I get on to what, uh, what we think the future of R&D might have to, have to look like. The first is around access to working capital. And so the membership that I'm talking about here is largely ag tech, food tech companies that are early stage revenue, pre-revenue, high growth companies. Uh, this is the immediate need that our members faced uh, post COVID-19 uh, and access to working capital. That was really because of reduced productivity due to physical distancing measures or complete plant shutdown. It could be related to loss of markets because of connected businesses in the agri-food supply chain were shut down or failed, or it could be because they were providing extended payment terms to their own customers who are also uh, suffering issues related to working capital. But collectively, that led to extremely tight working capital environment. And as a result, some companies started to pull back on non-essential expenditures, such as research and innovation. Secondly, the issue was access to growth capital. The growth capital markets have really dried up uh, quite quickly for the ag tech space in, in Canada. We think it's probably about an 18 to 24 month time frame for those growth capital markets to recover. This again is impacting long-term growth of some of these early and pre-revenue stage companies as they look to uh, re-enter the capital markets. The third area is around supply chain disruption. There's been a lot said about that today, so I'll, I'll maybe skip over the issues and challenges that our members are facing uh, as, as that's been spoken to quite extensively today. And maybe the fourth area that I'll just touch on before I give my comments and where I think R&D uh, and, and innovation needs to focus as a result is this idea of food sovereignty. And there's been a, a couple of, of my fellow panelists have, have spoke to this, but really in a similar vein to nations wanting to become more self-sufficient in the manufacturing of personal protective equipment and medical devices, uh, there is a move to start to and continue to enact policies to improve self-sufficiency of countries around the world. So we are a highly export dependent country uh, and we will have to remain that way post COVID-19. So I believe that is a trend that we'll, we'll need to continue to, to watch it unfold. So that maybe takes me to a discussion about if we understand the issues and challenges that our members are facing, uh, what, what would be some, some broad conclusions or, and, and some specific comments about the focus of science and innovation policy and R&D going forward? I think it's, it's largely three, three buckets as I see it. One is I think we need to increase the investments in science and innovation. Secondly, we have to create efficiency throughout the system, and I'll speak about three areas where I think we need to focus resources to do that. And the third is to be more responsive to changing consumer demands on a go-forward basis. So to, to just address that first one in terms of focused, uh, you know, increasing the investments in science and innovation, I think there's two parts to that. It is uh, innovation policy in Canada that includes additional support for public sector research, but also policies that incent private sector innovation. And I understand that that's going to be a challenge given the current government deficits and the issues I just talked about in terms of access to growth and, uh, and working capital. But public sector research, there's no question, has underpinned the success of the agri-food sector in Canada through investments in public good and foundational work. And understanding that all levels of government are struggling fiscally right now, I would contend that pulling back on research and innovation is, is not the right area to restrict. It's, to me, not a question of should we in Canada be focused on foundational and public good research or commercial market-ready research and innovation in the private sector. It's a question of how do we support both foundational public work and commercial market-ready innovation in the private sector. So we need to continue, I believe, with innovation policy in Canada that incentivizes private sector investment in innovation. Uh, so programming like the Innovation Supercluster Initiative has undoubtedly increased innovation spending in the private sector. And I think provincial governments could also look to do more to incent private sector R&D. The next three issues that I'll talk to all speak to trying to create efficiency within the system. 
And so the first is to improve and increase collaborative R&D approaches. So we know that research and development budgets are highly constrained across all sectors, private sector, public sector, and academic institutions. And therefore, I believe it's more important now more than ever that we encourage collaborative R&D, that we're working with one another in the agri-food space to leverage strength, to extend our finite resources, and to allow for specialization and efficiency, not only in Canada in the domestic context, but internationally as well. We need to ensure a high level of R&D collaboration on a go-forward basis. The second around increasing efficiency is to really take what I would call a value chain approach to research and development, not dissimilar to many of the comments I've heard today, but taking a value chain approach to research and development and innovation uh, is not, uh, it's about efficiency and the speed of outcomes. Today, Canada's agri-food chain uh, can, can partner better together to innovate and find solutions to challenges that any one person in the value chain cannot solve on their own. And, uh, you know, the solution to one deficiency in a crop might be a strength in, in another, you know, uh, the strength of one value chain can support another sustainable feed ingredients, help make sustainable meat products, um, byproducts from the livestock sector, uh, help make sustainable crops, and interconnected research is, is critical as we think about uh, a competitive domestic and, uh, and export agri-food system. Um, the, the third area I would suggest in terms of creating efficiency in the system is really about increased focus on multidisciplinary research. Uh, you know, the problems and challenges that, uh, that need to be examined uh, require very novel solutions. So a breeding program might, uh, a breeding problem rather, might be solved by an engineering solution during processing. Uh, consumer concerns might be addressed by production practices and nutrition needs by plant breeding. So the more we can focus on interdisciplinary research, I think the more responsive our entire R&D system will be. We need to think about you know, collaboration, a value chain approach, and multidisciplinary research in concert with one another. But all three of these are distinct and need focus and are all aimed at increasing efficiency in the system. And finally, I'll, I'll maybe touch on my thoughts around the need to increase focus on product differentiation to further establish Canada's global value proposition. I heard a couple of comments today about um, uh, you know, Canada becoming more self-sufficient in food and Canada first. I, I don't disagree with that, but we really need to be careful there. I believe it's a fine line for Canada. We're one of five jurisdictions globally that is a net exporter of food. Western Canada, we export over 80% of what we grow. We cannot become too insular in our thinking about food sovereignty in this nation just because flour got a little bit tight uh, post COVID-19. If, if we need to think though about the lasting effects of COVID-19 with respect to food sovereignty in Canada, uh, and even issues and challenges that are we're, we're facing pre-COVID-19 with Canada and India in terms of trade embargoes, it points to a focus and a need for us to engage strategic partners globally and really ensure that we're meeting the needs of our end use customer demand and moving from where we are today, which is commodity supplier to where we have to be in the future, which is ingredient provider. So buying is shifting, I, I believe from companies that are that from shifting to companies that are focused on what their end use customers want and need. And if we can meet those demands, it really helps insulate ourselves from non-tariff trade barriers, from trade disruptions, and domestic policies that are aimed at keeping out our agricultural commodities. So I would contend uh, a further increase focus on product differentiation, uh, leveraging Canada's value proposition in global markets, and really understanding our end-use customer needs as we emerge uh, from the post-COVID era. So thanks again to Serge for the invitation and my fellow panelists, and I'll, I'll end my comments there. Thanks, Bill. It's uh, Stan Blade here, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. It's a great pleasure. Thank you to Dr. Curran, uh, certainly to Serge and for Christine Helm for her uh, technical ma magic to uh, pull all of this off. Uh, I've had a look at the participant list. It's great to see so many partners, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, friends uh, that are also participating in this call. Uh, just to give a, a little bit of a sense of uh, where we sit as a faculty within AILS, you know, certainly 
uh, COVID has had this remarkable in, uh, impact on us. Uh, as a faculty, we're very proud of the fact that we have work that connects agriculture to nutrition, uh, certainly the food sector all the way through to human health, uh, but we also have a great deal of expertise in things like soils, water, uh, uh, biodiversity. We have uh, a whole set of people that are involved in resource economics and those sorts of things. So uh, our faculty has a richness uh, that I think uh, uh, I will bring up in the four topics that I'm going to discuss. I think it's just important also to recognize our people. I know all of you would have this same view. Uh, it has been remarkable to see how our faculty and how faculties and colleges across the country have reacted. Uh, those of you that I've spoken to already, you've heard me say that Everything that makes our faculty cool, amazing, uh, has also led us to a thousand discussions and a thousand decisions over the last eight weeks uh, to change our entire mode of delivery to our students uh, uh, to, a, to a remote delivery system. In our case, we have 10,000 hectares of farms and ranches, hundreds of head of cattle, uh, our poultry, our dairy, our swine facilities, all of those things continue to work. And in fact, uh, we now have a very uh, robust system for re-engaging, for relaunching not only our field research that we've been very uh, careful about, according to our chief medical officer, uh, but also re-engaging in our labs as people are coming back, because these are key issues that we are dealing with uh, within our faculty and across uh, all of those uh, uh, research and teaching institutions across uh, our country. Just one little piece uh, that is, uh, I think is just so reflective of the great work of people across uh, uh, colleges and universities. In our case, our faculty developed a six module course around COVID-19 uh, and the impact on agriculture and food. Uh, we've had registrants from 50 countries. We're up to a thousand participants. Uh, the fourth uh, uh, module will be tomorrow, but clearly just like this uh, virtual conference, the world is out there thinking very much about food and agriculture and how all of these things uh, come together. Right, so I'm gonna, uh, I had a suspicion given where I was in the batting order that a lot of these specific items would be spoken about. I think just to help you uh, provide a, a sense of where I'm going, I'm gonna talk about four particular areas uh, and maybe just pick a couple of highlights in each of those. And you'll see a theme here. Uh, the first theme that I'm talking about is reimagining. Now, what I'm going to suggest to some of you will be heresy because I've seen that participant list. Um, we, as an industry, have talked a lot about One Health. And One Health has very much been a, a, uh, uh, an amazing uh, continuation of work that came out of the UN, uh, uh, out of the World Bank, which really tied together human health, animal health, and antimicrobial resistance. Really, that was the umbrella around One Health. I guess what I'm proposing in this reimagination as we think about COVID and post-COVID activities and research, that we maybe expand that a little bit. That we start thinking about plant health. Our faculty is one of the world leaders in club root. How do we make sure that microbes that are involved in plants? I have loved the talk about soil health. We've just hired a new faculty member that connects plants, soils, microbes, uh, and all of the work that we do within the environmental sciences on environmental health. And then there's even that piece around, um, let's say system health. Uh, uh, again, I've, been, uh, I've appreciated people bringing up uh, uh, the, the mental uh, health issues that our people throughout our system are dealing with. Obviously the economic issues that we've talked about. So I guess my first, um, a piece of that puzzle is thinking about how we reimagine ourselves, even to frame our questions. And maybe it's not one health, maybe there's too much baggage associated with just the zoonosis issues around animal uh, and, and uh, humans. Maybe it's uh, global health, maybe it's uh, omna health. But I think the kinds of people that are represented on this call, this is really the opportunity for us to do the kinds of things that many have already brought up predictive analytics. Uh, the use of AI, the use of data really as that, that key resource that then we can use to, to drive the rest of the questions, the rest of the improvements in our system. So the first piece that I'm talking about is that uh, reimagining. The second one, um, again, you will see the theme here, is the opportunity to reflect. We've had eight weeks now 
where we are really re thinking all of the ways that we have been working within our agriculture and food sectors. So many have been named, I'll just pick out a couple. Global food supply chains, I've seen some of the questions that are coming out there. You know, we want to be global and we wanna maintain those supply systems, but we also want to have local. Uh, the Economist just came out uh, with an idea what of uh, this, this morning actually about, will there be a balance there between uh, reshoring, bringing jobs and industries back into our country, some of the things that Bill mentioned. Will there be a redundancy piece where we will still request uh, and take advantage of imports and exports of food between nations, but also having uh, some capacity within countries like Canada? It'll be interesting to see how that works. We do a lot of work within our faculty around consumer choice. Um, how are people going to re-engage with the food industry? I was at my favorite restaurant last night to celebrate my wife's birthday. We were the only people in that restaurant uh, that is allowed now under the Alberta's uh, chief medical officer. It's a 50% uh, physical distancing, but clearly we've already heard the challenges that restaurants are facing. How do we understand the motivation of citizens? How are we gonna reconnect? We have scientific ways of doing those sorts of studies to understand how citizens are gonna respond post COVID. COVID. There's also been a lot of discussion around local production. Uh, you may have seen in the press one of our uh, faculty members being quoted around meat processing. Uh, you know, there's a reason why there aren't a thousand abattoirs uh, and meat processing facilities across this country. The industry has been driven by economies of scale. Uh, uh, Dr. Ruard's observation was that yes, there is a possibility for that kind of local production, but it's not just to shrink the same things that our major multinational companies are doing in, in animal processing. It's to do things uniquely, to do things differently. And I think there are opportunities for research on how to figure that out. In this whole rethinking area, I've already talked about how we responded in the course of four days to becoming a remote delivery uh, institution, as did all of our of various universities and colleges across the country, we need to think differently about how we're going to actually provide information. I like the uh, comments that were made earlier. How do we do executive education differently? Now we bring people in for two or three weekends and we, we give them all kinds of opportunities, but physically they, in some cases, have to be here. This, I think, has created a whole new opportunity for us to think very much about how we deliver differently do we need our international students to be here for three or four years? Uh, all of those things now come into play uh, that I think will lead to some very interesting opportunities for us in the future. So I've talked about reimagining this idea of One Health is something much bigger. I've talked about reflecting on what the COVID situation has taught us. And now I'm gonna talk about how we reframe things. Uh, 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 Jatendra, I will just seek leave from you. I take your point about uh, farm to fork. Canada still has not been able to actually articulate what we want to do in the agri-food space. You have all seen that the EU just released their farm to fork 2030 uh, report. It speaks comprehensively about the sorts of things that a whole array of countries, diverse countries, want to be able to do together and yet, and I know many of you have worked on various pieces of this and have been strong advocates for it, but the fact that Canada cannot point to an agriculture, to a food strategy that this country can work towards means that it makes all of the other things much more complicated. There's a good news story to this because so many of the things that people have talked about, sustainable, resilient production, food security issues, indigenous populations in the North, the profitability of our sectors, um, the healthy diets, the, the human nutrition aspect, food loss and waste. We and our faculty on working on these things with private sector colleagues, with uh, NGOs, with government support. That's certainly true of our partner uh, institutions across the country and universities and colleges. So there's a good news piece there of we have a lot of the pieces of the puzzle, but we need to bring them together under a particular umbrella. And I think this is an opportunity for all of us so that we can be able to express to elected officials, to all of our colleagues within the private sector, other groups within research organizations and training organizations, what Canada really wants to get done. Brazil did this 15 years ago and it's amazing 
the, uh, the amount of effectiveness that they've seen in their agri-food system. We need to be on the ball in being able to do that. And the third piece, I've talked about reimagining or reflecting of reframing. Uh, the last piece for me is around the reinvestment side of it. Bill, I think, spoke uh, very um, eloquently about where we need to invest and certainly the agri-food sector. There is no entitlement to the GDP that ag and food produces in this country, nor in any of the provinces that are represented. Um, I, I had the good fortune of being invited when uh, Secretary of Agriculture Purdue announced the U.S. Uh, approach uh, uh, of uh, their agricultural innovation agenda, billions of dollars bringing together the USDA and all of its uh, remarkable activities focused on actually increasing productivity by 40%, decreasing environmental footprint by 50%. Go across all of the jurisdictions that we compete with across the globe. They are investing in agri-food. And I, I fear that sometimes we're not necessarily thinking about agri-food as an investment in, in, uh, uh, in Canada. Uh, our faculty engages very strongly with people that do invest. This is not a, a wasteland. Our, our faculty gets 40 or $50 million a year in external funding to do the kind of work that I've outlined. So there is certainly promise there. And I would say the other aspect of that is the, the, the citizens of Canada. Uh, you know, we know that somewhere between nine and 11% of disposable income is being used on food for most citizens of Canada. Certainly the data from lower economic uh, groups, that can be up to 35 or 40% of their income just because of uh, the, 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 the low amount of disposable income that's available. So I think there are real opportunities for us to think differently about uh, uh, how we do this reinvestment as well. So uh, I think I will I'll leave it there. I, I would just say that, uh, um, you know, that there are some real opportunities for us uh, with respect to COVID and where we're coming out of. There's a strong base for us to build on. But I think what I've really emphasized is being able to show that we uh, have an idea of what we're doing, that we can express that, and then that we can actually implement it. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. I, I look forward to the questions. Uh, thanks, Dan. Troy Taylor, Vice President of Operations of Restaurants Canada. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, uh, Christine, it was great for you to put this together. Um, I Stan, there's a couple of things you said I can't agree more with uh, uh, the coming together of the whole system. I've, I, or we from Restaurants Canada, we probably spent more time on the phone in the last two months with suppliers, processors, uh, um, you know, commodity groups, et cetera, um, than we have in the last five years. It's just, uh, if, it's, if this has done one thing and one positive thing to come out of this would be the, the coalition of thinking, which I think is important and, and needs to continue. So 100% agree with a few of the things that you said there. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Restaurants Canada is the voice of, for food service. We've been in existence for about 75 years, um, and our goal is to help ensure the uh, restaurant uh, uh, system's profitability and, and existence now, it seems like. Um, so going last, I thought, you know, there's many of the things that have been said that we had on our list to, to cover, so I won't re, um, regurgitate some of the things that were sent today, but what I thought may be important is to um, maybe sound the alarm bell uh, for all that are on the uh, on the call uh, on what's what we're facing and what's what's happening today. Um, I sent out a couple of slides uh, that just uh, there was uh, from a week and a half ago on a survey that we've done. We, we're pulsing um, uh, our membership, um, which consists of about forty five thousand odd units across the country. Um, try to get a gauge as we do this weekly because. Um, independent operators, you know, on the calls that I'm on uh, are looking uh, at their watch by hour, not necessarily by week or month. And I expect many of you on this call are looking at, you know, multiple years down the road. So the only thing I would, I would start off by saying that there is a sense of urgency um, uh, to what's happening out there and it'll certainly affect the, the entire supply chain. So a couple quick numbers for you. Um, we've got 40% of the businesses in Canada right now that are closed. Uh, and of the 60% that are opened, 30% uh, of them you would think of as the McDonald's and the Tim Hortons that do regular takeout business. And there's about 30% of the people out there that are just trying to do anything uh, in terms of takeout to, to, to survive. So that number of 40% closed is really a lot higher because um, people are just trying to do you know, anything. They might not have had a, 
a takeout type business, but they're trying to keep their staff employed or their chefs employed. So they're not really a, uh, you know, a takeout um, uh, based program that you would think of uh, on some of the big chains. Um, the last, uh, th uh, this survey was two weeks ago um, and we had 70% said that they're very or extremely worried that their business won't survive over the next three months. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, a big warning bell for all of us um, that are looking, especially on the supply side. We have been talking to the government and um, uh, uh, Denise um, had talked a little bit about it. Uh, three issues really all centered around liquidity, which is, you know, rents that are due. Uh, and then the you know paying for the products that uh, that are in the system that weren't being that weren't able to be sold, and as well as sort of staffing up, if you will, uh, going forward. So uh, rent being the key issue, um, we've had more than half of the restaurants said they didn't pay their rent in April. Uh, obviously, that's uh, going into May, and now we're going to cross the June period, which is the three month, you know, uh, window that we talked about. The seventy percent said that they're probably not going to make it. So we're in tough times now. Um, I happened to be on a call yesterday. Uh, we're putting together a, uh, a COVID recovery conference the week of the 7th or 8th, I believe, uh, uh, for operators. Um, and one of the sessions that we're having is uh, on rent. And we had bailiffs and whatnot uh, on the phone, lawyers, et cetera. And uh, one of the bailiffs had said that they he was doing an average of 30 to 40 closures um, you know, per month. And he's now doing 30 to 40 per day uh, to give you a context of the, of the scale. Uh, so not necessarily very good right now. Um, you, uh, um, Denise also mentioned the rent program and, and um, you know, we pushed the government really hard on the rent program. And I'm not sure if they just don't get it or just don't want it to, you know, don't want to cross the line and step into the ground of um, infringing with what landlords have in terms of contracts. But, you know, we've 70% of our independent operators said that They've, uh, their landlords aren't willing to participate uh, in the rent program. Um, again, last night on the call with, the, uh, with uh, a lot of the people in that community said, you know, if you think about it, you know, a lot of people would have paid their March rent because that would have happened, you know, post March 1. They may have had enough to pay April. They, many don't have enough to pay May. Now you're crossing June. Now a lot more hands will go up. So I think that um, the attention from the landlords will have to pick up now uh, if they've been pushing this off as uh, don't worry about it to, uh, oh boy, we've got a lot of people now with their hands up. Um, this may force them to, into the program. And I think you may have heard Ford yesterday. Um, he took a little bit of a bully stance with landlords to say, you know, you know, help out or, you know, fear the wrath of the Ford government. Um, so I think that was a, a good sign, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that any of the big corporations uh, will, you know, the big landlords will stand up and, and take notice of that. Um, we also, um, uh, we, we, uh, Denise also talked about the liquidity issue and I thank them for, for uh, bringing that forward to, uh, to the uh, Minister of Finance. Um, how, I, how I'd like to explain it, um, the, the, the liquidity issue is if you think about a restaurant versus a, you know, I don't know, a t-shirt company, um, a restaurant would have had a whole whack of produce and products come into the restaurant and then we're told to shut down. Uh, that product couldn't be sold uh, and is either A, going bad, which we hope is not the case, uh, or B, has, have, has gone home with, um, you know, either employees or to a food bank, uh, which has been, which is a, a benefit of all this, but it's product that they haven't been able to sell. And so while we've been all looking and gearing up for the actual reboot, uh, we know that, um, you know, the, the distributor community is going to say, yeah, well, you haven't paid for my, my March bill. Now you want to load up in June uh, because you're completely empty and um, we're going to need cash for that, please. COD, as, as, as me said. If we get into that situation, to me, it's just slowing down the, the startup of the whole supply chain and you guys are feeling it at, at the other end. Um, so if we don't do something about it, it's just going to prolong this months longer, which is going to be uh, problematic uh, you know, for all of us. So those are the three things that we're looking at as kind of the liquidity. The last one is, is staffing. Um, as you guys can imagine, you guys are feeling the same thing uh, from the staff side. Um, you know, when we put up the sign that says, okay, guys, back to work, we're really not sure how many are gonna come back to work. Um, uh, some of the programs, um, uh, you know, we've had some of our chain members uh, talk a little bit uh, concerningly about the amount of money that, that people are making at home now and why would I risk my, 
health going to work when I make as much as I do, <laughs> you know, going into a, a fast food chain. So labor is going to be a, a significant issue as it is um, as it is for as it is for you guys. So um, I don't want to be the alarmist at the end, but I think um, what I was hoping to just try to give you guys a sense of that we, as of June, we're now passing into the red line territory, if you will. Um, uh, unprecedented is certainly a word that's thrown around a lot, but uh, in this sector, I, I, I really don't know uh, how many people will pass uh, and be able to get through to July. Um, the other thing that we've talked about is uh, uh, we know the government throws around the 50% capacity you know, uh, number as a as a as a way to uh, may, maybe placate the consumer and 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 cer certainly the you know the social concerns. But um, most restaurants can't can't uh, operate on a fifty percent uh, capacity uh, ratio. I think if you can imagine, you know, a lot of restaurants sit empty Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday they they are full um, and have a couple of turns to be able to be profitable. But if you cut that business down in half, it's one of the things that we've been trying to say to government is that 50% capacity isn't underlined, isn't 50% revenue. Um, and uh, in an industry that has small margins, that's tough. So, you know, one of the things that we talked about is that, um, you know, two thirds of our restaurants said that, you know, if this goes, the 50% capacity goes belong, uh, longer than, uh, you know, three to six months, that they're not going to make it as well. So when you take when when you look at the total restaurant business, there's about a uh, 120,000 restaurants that we estimate. 50% uh, of those are chains, uh, and then uh, you know give or take a few percentage points down to independents. And if you cut that in half and lose that half of the business, we could be walking away from a quarter percent of potentially the end users of uh, of the supply chain here, which is a significant number. So that's kind of the uh, the uh, the alarm bell going up for et al. Um, and Stan, I agree with you coming together to solve this stuff is going to be uh, absolutely paramount. Um, while you guys are thinking and collectively we all thinking long term, I think the short term piece for me is um, the Canada first positioning because I think more and more people, I think will trust stuff that is made in Canada versus uh, around the world today and that security that goes along with that. And I think the big thing that would be collectively if you were to stand back and I don't know if it's if it's uh, if it's egg or whoever would be you know, how do we instill the consumer confidence that, you know, our product is safe um, and we've got all the measures in, in, in place and the stuff that's coming to your table is in fact, uh, is in fact secure. I think that's going to play a big role in, uh, in, in, in helping us, uh, helping us get out of this. So I didn't want to, uh, I don't want to be last and everybody walked away with kind of their head down between their legs and kind of like, Oh God, here's, there's a wave coming. But um, I think it's important to, uh, you know, to sort of put the, the reality of what we're facing today in the mix of what we're thinking of um, long term. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Troy. I really appreciate uh, your thought. And I really want to thank all of our panelists uh, today. Um, great uh, presentations and uh, very interesting thoughts from uh, everyone on the on a number of issues. And Troy, you, I think you, you hit uh, the hit, uh, the nail on the head when you talked about uh, consumer confidence, um, I think it's going to be uh, essential for people to go back out to buy, um, to spend as well, uh, which we're going to need them to do in order to kickstart this economy and, and continue to prosper as a country. Um, I'm going to go through the, to some of the Q and A's, uh, questions, sorry, that were asked for the Q and A button. But what I would like to do to make sure that I don't uh, stifle uh, uh, anybody wanting to ask a question is, um, as an attendee, you have a button uh, that uh, allows you to raise your hand. Um, and if you want to do that, uh, please do so. And that will allow me to uh, recognize you as well. I will do one of the questions that answer, that's uh, already asked and ask the panelists to comment on this. And then I will do uh, one of the questions uh, uh, that uh, from the people, from the attendees that will be raising their hands. So going to the first Q&A um, uh, and by votes, it's uh, a question asked by Jerry Gualandres, um, mentioning that it's an emerging paradox. On the, on the one hand, I hear that we should invest in scalable technologies, automation mechanism, crop productivity, animal efficiency productivity. On the other, I hear that we need to reduce our reliance on global value chains and focus on local systems. 
my question is how to balance those priorities and trends. What novel supply chain structure can enhance productivity efficiency without exacerbating interdependencies and vulnerabilities? A very simple questions that all of our panelists can answer in a couple of words, I'm sure. Who wants to take a first stab at it? Uh, uh, unmute your button and, uh, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Whoever is going to uh, uh, go for the first. Uh, uh, first. Otherwise, I'm going to point. I'll, I'll take a stab at this, Serge. Um, it's Keith Curry. I, I think in the short term, there has to be a huge economic component to this because, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at world economies that are going to be in deep trouble, including Canada's, where there's a lot of money being spent right now. There's a lot of economic downturn. So I think from the aspect of, of the economic standpoint and how this industry can actually, as I mentioned earlier, can actually start to drive some of that recovery. I think that's where the initial investment needs to go. And then they also there also needs to be a vision of long term. OK, as we come out of this situation, I don't know how long it's going to take, two years, three years, 10 years. But, but have a look at how that investment then proceeds uh, beyond the economic recovery aspect. Um, can we look at some private sector funding, P3 type of funding? I don't know the various ways that we can have, have private money come into the sector to invest where we need to, uh, certainly processes, processing has been identified as a need right now, the, the real cog in the whole chain that needs to keep going. I know that we do need research to get a lot of our ideas on where we need to invest, but I think that recovery part is, is big, you know, that economic recovery part is really key to the beginning and then we can adjust from there and, and, and invest where we need to. Great. Anyone else? Hi, hi, can you hear me? We can. Oh. So I'm sorry, is it my turn? Go ahead, Denise and Bill will go next. Okay, I'm sorry to uh, interject here. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, duck out in about five minutes. I've got another speaking opportunity, but uh, this has been a great session. And um, uh, on, on the question of scalability, I just wanted to speak to you in parting um, about hyper local food systems. And I'm not speaking to you as a CEO of Food Processors of Canada right now. I'm speaking to you as a special advisor and participant in a hyper local food system called the Pan Cape Breton Food Hub. And uh, just to put things in context, around the turn of the century, previous century, we had about 2,500 independent farms on Cape Breton Island. Uh, today, that's under 300. I think the last number count was about 285. And the Pan Cape Breton Food Hub was designed um, to bring a lot of that, uh, mark, that food to market uh, efficiently, uh, but in a way that's creative and doesn't compromise the values of the farmers that still choose to homestead and, 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 uh, and raise crops and, and livestock here. Um, what we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic is a small silver lining is an absolute explosion in membership and ordering through the Pan Cape Breton Food Hub. So our focus is now shift from how do we get more farmers, that's always an issue and a challenge, but how do we get um, greater infrastructure in place for processing, freezing, uh, cold storage, things like that, so that we can access uh, different markets and expand our reach. So that's one of the positives, and I, I wouldn't want to lose sight of the value um, uh, that uh, agriculture and local producers bring. Your food choices um, should reflect uh, your personal, cultural, and regionally relevant um, and sustainable uh, food options and choices. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say thank you for the opportunity again and, and hand it over to, um, to the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, so I just, I, I maybe don't know that I view it as, as a paradox. And I, so the, the fundamentals that underpin the growth of the agri-food sector in Canada and globally are pretty undeniable in terms of population trends, emerging middle classes, requirements for plant protein. And so we are one of five jurisdictions globally that is a net exporter of food. And so if, if we invest in scalable technologies and automation, mechanization, crop productivity and animal, animal efficiency and productivity, we will be very, very well served in terms of meeting the global demand for food uh, post COVID-19. And so I'm not, I'm not sure that I view this, you know, there is going to be a greater reliance on local food systems, but the reality is 
um, most jurisdictions globally will not be self-sufficient in food. So anything that we can do to increase our own productivity and increase our ability to be a supplier of choice globally, I think uh, will serve us very well in the long term. If that's okay, I'm going to go to the next question and I'm going to ask, uh, um, maybe what I will try to do is get the participants to, uh, uh, to, to ask questions. And Perry Johnson, uh, you, you from uh, Genome Canada, you had a question which you asked. I'm going to let you speak if that's okay. Perry, are you able to speak? I've uh, allowed you to talk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, Perry Johnston here. I'm sitting in my yard uh, in Ottawa, and I've enjoyed the session very much. Uh, I'm joined today from uh, with uh, many of the uh, uh, chief executive officers from the genome centers across the country. I'm representing Genome Canada and the new uh, Vice President Policy and Public Affairs. And um, I was really interested to hear um, a theme across many of the panelists um, comments about the uh, potential uh, to scale our strengths in biotechnology, specifically genetics uh, and genomics to uh, meet the, the challenges that were identified with respect to enhanced soil health, uh, greater nutritional value, uh, crop breeding, uh, synthetic uh, manufacturing and synthetic biology. So many areas in which the genomics knowledge and technologies that Canada has can really be scaled and leveraged. Um, one of the things that I was chatting about with the uh, leadership at many of our genome centers though, are the regulatory challenges that we currently face in Canada with respect to fully embracing these technologies, particularly when they interface with robotics and AI. And I'm just wondering if the panelists could speak to this in terms of, you know, your, um, your advice, particularly to those on the call from the federal government, about what we need to do in the regulatory space to fully position Canada uh, to um, uh, take its strengths in the genomics technologies space to uh, the scale we need to, to really uh, meet our agri-food goals. And what other countries are doing it well that we could learn from? Thanks. Serge, if I may, would you allow me to respond? I think that, uh, I think that we have a, a serious challenge in terms of regulatory. We will be held back if we do not shift how we look at regulation. Uh, one of the sector table recommendations was to move swiftly to a digital sandbox whereby regulation could be tested in very um, simple, easy ways. We also have to take, we also have to rid ourselves of some of our former regulations that stand in place. And I see that we're going to have to get to a point of uh, setting the standard or leading the charge in terms of data trusts, data government regulations and standards. And I think if Canada, Canada would take a pivotal role um, we would advance our ability to um, absolutely shine in that regard. And Perry, you're so right. If we do not get this handled, uh, new technologies will be held back in Canada. So if, if I can, can chime in as well on, on that, um, not so much from the, from the regulations as they apply to genomics and things like that, but a lot of a lot of the issues with, with our industry and that we hear a lot from our members has to do with uh, the, uh, the differences in uh, plant protection uh, requirements around the world, particularly even, you know, when you've got, I think the example I was given was an apple grower on the north side of the St. Lawrence River is not allowed to use the same things that the apple grower on the south side of the St. Lawrence River is allowed to use. And, and obviously, um, you know, there, there's a situation where if, 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 if the Americans can use it, why can't, why can't a Canadian, given the fact that probably a significant amount of those apples being grown down south could end up here anyhow, um, given the amount of trade and whatnot. So I, I think, I think what we need is a, and I think we're, I think we're starting to see it, in, in, to be honest with you, there's been a lot of loosening up by necessity with on governments over the last few months. 
Um, I'm hoping that continues. And I, it, we really need to get to a, a common sense situation when it comes to regulations. Uh, certainly there will be things that have to be put in place for public safety reasons and, or, and for all sorts of reasons. But we need a system whereby the, the regulations that are, are put in place are, are common sense and don't get in the way of industry um, moving forward. Um, but actually can be put in place to, to help industry move forward. And it's another way, to, and, and just to, to, to you know, join Allison's point there, we need to do that internally, but Canada as a country also has to do that on an international stage. Um, certainly we're going to see a lot of countries you know, putting up barriers or trying to put up barriers. And I think Canada needs to be a strong um, common sense voice um, to, try and, to try and bring the reasonable side to that. Uh, from a global global perspective as well. Oh, thank you. Um, great, uh, great answers. Um, we we have some uh, some attendees from uh, the federal government, and I won't uh, I won't uh, uh, um, uh, put them on the spot. But if they do want to to answer, please uh, or provide some some thoughts. Um, I would certainly allow you, uh, let you do that. Just put your hand up and uh, and uh, let me know. So we have uh, Dr. Mithani, who was the president of the Canadian Food Inspection Inspection, Inspection Agency. Uh, we have uh, Gilles Saint-Don, the Assistant Deputy Minister for Research at uh, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and Denise, that you've heard of, uh, uh, from uh, the NRC. So um, anybody who wants to, to chime in, please uh, don't hesitate. Um, uh, or if you just want to uh, uh, reflect on this and provide uh, some thoughts later on, we'll be happy to circulate them. Um, uh, not seeing hands getting uh, raised uh, quickly on the attendee side, I'm going to go to the next question uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Krishna Raj. Um, Post-COVID, where do you think Canada um, uh, would be better positioned to invest the uh, dollars for innovation. What is your opinion? Um, and uh, Dr. Krishnaraj mentioned that in, in his opinion, uh, the processing infrastructure appears to be a critical need post COVID uh, as it was before COVID started. Uh, uh, but uh, anybody has uh, thoughts on where uh, should it be going to? Uh, Serge, maybe I could, uh, as sure. one of the people that are in financing on this side, I think that uh, we have to develop programs for matching investment in terms of business research and development expenditures. Uh, perhaps we have an accelerated depreciation, but maybe we have to super accelerate. If our food processing plants invest, let's, let's participate with them. We have seen um, business expenditures on research and development dropping. That's a very serious statistic for us in Canada. And so we have to think of ways if, if companies and individuals want to invest, we need to match it or super match it. Anyone else on the panel? Um, if, if I could just jump in too, Serge. Um, we need to find a system that allows the new, th that puts the new technologies in the hands of more producers and more of the smaller operators across the country. A lot of the, obviously a lot of the, the, the big companies, they have the resources, they have the, the staffing and whatnot, the, the expertise in-house to, 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 to work with new technologies or often create it themselves. Um, but there needs, there needs to be a way to get some of that into the hands of some of the smaller organizations um, so they can have access. And it, it would just add to the pot of ideas um, that would in the end help, help everybody out on it. Now, how you, how you monetize that, how you, how you balance that between the folks that, you know, do the research work and, and, and then the smaller folks who could really benefit from it, I don't know, but there needs to be a way to kind of mix that together a little more. Thank you. Uh, Serge, 
it, it's Bill here. Maybe just one quick comment before you move on. And and this is, you know, this is a question that's very Canadian in our thinking because it's a question of 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 or should we be investing in this or this? And I think, you know, it's it's not an easy discussion today because we are fiscally constrained, but we should be thinking about this as an and question. We are investing in science and innovation across academic institutions, both levels of government and the private sector in Canada, about one half of the OECD average. So I think the question needs to become how do we increase the level of innovation across all different areas of the agri-food sector, not not uh, picking and choosing. And so it comes back to some of my comments I made around increasing and improving efficiency in the system, because I, I, I fear that if we get into a discussion of, of where to invest, it's not a question of how much to invest. And I think that's actually the question is how do we increase the whole the level of investment across, uh, across the innovation spectrum? And, and Bill, I think um, I think I would agree wholeheartedly with you. We we have a tendency to to um, shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to prioritize um, uh, parts of the sector w without uh, giving uh, the wall sector uh, a, a better visibility for research dollars and for uh, investments. Uh, the fact of the matter is, in terms of industries in Canada, one that will continue to exist forever. Um, is agriculture and agri-food. We will continue to, to exist and uh, we will continue to be a food exporting nation um, and we, we, need to be, we need to be there. It will continue to create lots of jobs in this country and we need uh, a, a continued federal investment to, to maintain our position in the world and the employment it creates. So we, we will need to continue making that case and I guess that's the, partially the role of AIC in, in, in that uh, uh, in, in that, but uh, all the sectors uh, that you all represent on the panel are extremely important for us. Um, I'll go to uh, a couple of other questions. Again, I don't see any hands raised um, and that's okay, but uh, I'm going to ask um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Buchler to ask his question directly rather than me reading it, if that's okay. Uh, Hans, um, you're, uh, uh, you're able to, to ask your question directly. You unmute your button. I will otherwise okay. read his question. Oh, you're okay? Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, took me a while to, and uh, plus there's a little bit of a time delay. My connection goes through a satellite. So uh, there is, uh, yeah, I, I was really intrigued by uh, Keith's mention of uh, uh, soil health. Uh, and uh, it is a, an area where a lot more research uh, uh, should be done. Uh, if you uh, ask different farmers uh, their opinion on what soil health is, I think everybody probably comes up with a different answer. And it is uh, in the long term, in, in the interest of sustainability, I think we do need to focus much more on, uh, on what soil health is and what all our uh, practices, uh, what the impacts of all our practices on soil health actually are. And I think there's uh, much that is very poorly understood still in, in this area. It's a huge area of, uh, of uh, research that is to some degree very fragmented, I think, a, a much more holistic approach to this uh, uh, in, from a research side uh, would be really beneficial for agriculture and for the long-term sustainability. That's it. Any, uh, anybody on the panel? I'll maybe just jump in quickly, Serge, and, and I, I mean, thanks, thanks for the comments. Um, certainly, I think to go along with that type of investment in research comes some investment in education uh, along the chain. But, uh, you know, with respect to the farmers and ranchers out there that are, that are on the land and, and, and trying to earn a living off the land, the economies of scale have got us to the point where we have to live for today and we have to do what we need to do for today to survive economically. And sometimes that might come at a sacrifice of maybe a different type of approach to, to soil health. 
Um, it's not that anyone's trying to destroy soil health, but it's about that ultimate dollar because if we can't survive today, we're not going to be here for tomorrow. And there needs to be that education piece on the long-term benefits uh, right up and down the sector, but in particular in, in primary agriculture to understand how doing this results in that tomorrow. And, and that hasn't happened uh, maybe as frequently as, as we need it to be. So uh, that education piece along with this, I think is really key, especially in the primary ag sector. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a question if that's okay. Um, uh, uh, before we go to Jason uh, Switzer who has uh, his hand up, um, but I'm going to ask a question. Um, we've heard about the importance of working together and, and, and on the panel here, we have represented uh, academia, um, uh, restaurants, uh, producers, uh, investors, um, uh, etc. Um, this sector is very fragmented, and uh, and the sector has a tendency to to work in silos, um, and which is not helpful, right? Uh, when we talk about uh, investment and research and innovation, and we wonder why we have to fight and prioritize some sections of uh, the sector, it's often because we are not unified enough to to um, to make our case uh, directly as the, the whole food system. Um, does this crisis uh, in your mind as panelists advance the possibility of the sector working better together um, in, in, in pushing uh, uh, the priorities for research and innovation and the visibility of the whole sector? Uh, you know, I know at the AIC when we talk, we say we employ, uh, uh, the, the, the whole sector employs X um, million of people. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's so siloed and so diversified that we we are. It's hard to to actually make that case. Um, w if we were working together, would it work better? And do you think this crisis is changing this? So I'll I'll let you answer. Any panel, please. Anyone? <laughs> Nobody wants to talk. Um, certainly, Serge, uh, through, through this pandemic, I can talk about the primary egg sector in particular. Um, it has come together like I've never seen it in my lifetime. Uh, you know, working, working together uh, on, on trying to solve issues that are out there. But we've also done it in conjunction with the value chain for the most part. Uh, I wouldn't say that we've necessarily reached out to the research side of things because that hasn't been, uh, uh, we have, haven't, they haven't been seen as a way to solve immediate issues dealing with, with, with COVID. But certainly we've, we've been reaching out through the various sectors and, and I will say that, you know, provincial governments have been good to work with the value chains. Federal government, you know, we have an agriculture minister that's been very good in conversation, but honestly the, the federal government as a whole doesn't necessarily look at the agri-food production system uh, with the same kind of value that maybe we would hope that they would. Um, so there needs to be some consumer reach to get people to understand the importance of it. We, we talked about, you know, earlier about uh, the concern around either not getting local food or not getting food at all on shelves and perhaps some, some uh, reach out to the consuming public about expressing to the government the need to support this sector through the whole system that we, that, that has been mentioned several times here, whether that's primary production, uh, processing, retail, all in between, or the research that goes before and after what we're trying to do. And, and I think, you know, what I've seen in, in, in the last two months in particular is, is a much more combined effort to work together with different parts of the sector than I've ever seen. So can we use it going forward? I think the biggest part of our side being siloed in the past is that we're all fighting for very limited dollars. So we all want our piece of the pie and we don't want to give up anything to anyone else if we can get some. And that's been part of the struggle. So getting more funding, I think, will, will help alleviate some of that. Great. And maybe we can fight to increase the piece of, increase the size of the pie rather than fight for pieces of the pie. Talking about the pie, uh, uh, I, I see a hand up from Gilles Sandon. So, sorry, I'm going to allow Dr. Sandon to, to speak for a few seconds, for a few uh, for a little bit. Um, uh, Jill, you, you wanted to say a few words, Jill, as the uh, ADM for research at uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Jill. 
Thank you, Serge. Can you hear me? We can. Well, thank you. That's it's pretty heavy, the system. So I didn't want to take the previous question, but I have another question instead. So, uh, so I just heard like over the years in terms of uh, partnerships with uh, stakeholders and funding of research and all of that, we've done quite well with the uh, with the on the production side, like uh, with the producer get, getting involved with us and the tr usually through checkoffs. And I think we have mechanism there that have uh, been very good in terms of we have clusters, we have. Uh, a project we've been going on for quite some time in terms of partnership. But when I'm hearing the conversation here today uh, about the end point on, on, uh, on food production and talk about food, talk about the consumer and all that. And I think someone just said earlier that it's more, it's more fragmented. Like it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of players and there's no checkoff. There is no mechanism. And it's at times it's, uh, there are people like, uh, there are like, uh, uh, working in the same industry, they may work. They may want to work together. They may not. Uh, I think there is an impetus now, like uh, if we do something maybe different with production. And, and I see, like Bill, you're there, like uh, with the uh, uh, try to create a knowledge sector in the at uh, the at uh, the, uh, uh, the the at the uh, foods end of the spectrum. Like uh, uh, you mentioned, ingredients instead of production and all of that. So. I think I think whatever we can do, uh, Bill, you're, you're trying to to build capacity in the private sector as well, resilience. But they will continue to be capacity. The same way we build seed sector at one point in time in this country, we build uh, I mean uh, R and D capacity in the private sector. At the food end, this is where I think Bill, you're kind of uh, uh, opening up a path there right now, and I just hope that will that will that will get somewhere because I think this is where. The, the key ingredient will be like uh, we need partners we need as in the private sector to be able to partner with us instead of just like being a funder of research we need okay. partner beyond funding research great so i'm, I'm going to allow bill to, to provide some uh, comments and then allison uh, as well please after so bill and allison yeah thanks Thanks, Jill. So as, as a super cluster today, we, we've got 11 projects that we've approved. We've invested $79 million, a total project bank of about $153 million. And, um, you know, the, the, the most successful projects that we've done today is are those that involve different verticals of the value chain. So, you know, the basis of an investment from us as a super cluster is collaborative R&D. There must be two for-profit private sector companies involved. The majority of our projects have more than that, and the most successful ones to date have been ones where we've included uh, plant breeder, processor, and consumer packaged goods. And so I, I think it's going to take time. Uh, we have to incentivize it. We have to change behaviors. But the, the most successful projects are the ones that we have uh, brought together people that have never thought about working before, and the, and the, and the clustering theory is starting to emerge in terms of one and one being greater than two. So, Joe, you know, I, I appreciate your comments. I completely agree. And I think we're going to have it play out here in the super cluster model. Uh, you know, to me, this is one where we cannot take our foot off the gas and have to keep incenting investment in innovation at the private sector, because at the end of the day, that is the only place where we get GDP growth and job creation. Good comments, Bill. Uh, Jason Switzer asked a question about uh, investor capital availability and corporate willingness to partner uh, with ag tech ventures. That's just an excellent question. Uh, over the past five years, there's been a 250% increase in agri-food funding. And from a venture capital perspective, I, I truly think that agri-food is the area of of most likely to invest worldwide. Now, how can Canada position themselves? Number one, we need a strong ecosystem. The uh, super cluster initiatives were a starting point. Uh, groups like Creative Destruction Lab that I spoke to where we're tapping into mentorship and long-term mentorship and access to capital. I think the private sector has a role to play. And I truly believe that we have a healthy financial ecosystem. A lot of people think that we do not, we do. 
but we need to encourage adoption of technologies within Canada first. My company had, we were a success everywhere before we were a success in Canada. And that's not a good thing. So I think that all of our strategies must be focused on building that capital network. Um, I'm very focused on building the capital network for agri-food in Canada. And I believe that there's several venture capital companies that are. Um, I'm a venture partner at Builders VC. We made some of the original investments in uh, the Climate Corp, Granular, and what I really want to see. And now we've also made an investment in Provision Analytics, which is a protein supercluster uh, project. And I personally invested in that company. So I think this is what it takes. I think that we need to show people that agri-food is a great investment space, and it is. And we need to we need to evolve and support that ecosystem. Great, um, thank you. I'm going to allow uh, one last question, Jason Schweitzer. I'm going to um, uh, enable you to uh, talk. Um, and um, uh, but very very short question, please, Jason. And then after that, I'll do a roundup uh, um, uh, uh, round. So, Jason, if you want to uh, say a couple of words. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be cheeky. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. And uh, thank you, Allison. That's a great answer uh, to my earlier question. Um, and of course, you're, you're, you put skin in the game. Um, I'll ask two really short questions. One is, what do we need to do to incent corporate participation by companies like Maple Leaf, Nutrien, and so on up and down the value chain? Uh, and then secondly, will the, uh, Serge, will the YouTube be available uh for rewatch later because i was running around chasing kids this morning and i wasn't able to participate and follow the conversation as much as i would have liked so yes this is going to be on youtube um and it will be available to rewatch later i will be sending a link uh for your first question uh any uh, any answer from the panelists a very short answer please i think i'd go back jason to accelerated depreciation if a company's going to put St put a stake in the ground and let's let's reward them through some methodology similar to that thank you anyone else quickly hearing none um i'm thank you very much everyone um uh, it's been a great uh, session very interesting um we we're uh, we went uh, longer than I thought with the question and answer se uh, section, but I think that was uh, relevant and important to get. Um, uh, so we, we've had uh, a couple of hours and a little bit more than a couple of hours of discussion between the presentations and, um, and the question and answer. Uh, we've, uh, we've had this survey that uh, went on before and uh, we'll continue to survey participants and, and the whole sector after that. Um, at AIC, one of the things that we do is we use those conferences to not just have the opportunity for people to talk, uh, but uh, 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 really to get action uh, moving after that. So the intention is to uh, more or less uh, uh, take the information that we've received and, and, and try to put something together uh, that will enable us to get a position statement on what we think research and innovation needs to move uh, uh, after this. So my assumption is that within a week, you're gonna get a, a draft report and you'll be asked to provide some comments uh, on, on the report to all the panelists and all the attendees. And then uh, after that, we'll circulate the report and we'll put it uh, uh, online and we'll certainly continue to uh, promote the report uh, within the federal government and, and other stakeholders, including the provinces. So I want to thank everybody for participating. It's been a great uh, experience. It's our first event. I want to thank Christine for uh, uh, doing a great job to uh, organize this, the technical aspect, because I've got no idea. I just pushed a mute and unmute button and uh, on occasion forget to push the mute button, which gets me in trouble. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, everyone for participating. It's been great and I'm really interested um, I was really interested at the level of participation that we got today um, uh, from organizations. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that and we'll do that a little bit more. Thank you so much. And uh, you'll hear back from us with this uh, draft report at the end uh, in about a week uh, from now. 
won't be a long report, it'll be a few pages, but uh, uh, mainly to, uh, going through some of the discussions that we've had. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye.